blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight Angels descending bring from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love This is my story, this is my song Praising my Saviour all the day long This is my story this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His good. In his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long Blessed assurance, this is my story, this is my song. Jesus praising my Savior all the day long. Easter, Resurrection Sunday that we celebrated last Lord's Day gives us all the more reason to worship and praise our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're glad that you've joined us here at Harlandale Christian Church today as we worship our Lord together. As we lift up our praises to, to him in thanksgiving and, and in worship, thanking him for uh, giving us the salvation, bringing us salvation when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. So the psalmist in uh, Psalm 16 verses 7 and 8 uh, mirrors that message of blessed assurance. He says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Let's begin our worship time in prayer to our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the joy that we have of being able to come to you in prayer. Being able to come together in fellowship with each other and with you here in our worship time. Thank you for being here in our midst through your spirit because you and your son Jesus have, have given us the promise in the scriptures where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are there in the midst. Thank you for that, Father. And as we celebrate, as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray that you receive our worship, our adoration, our praise, and our thanks 
for your presence, your blessing, your salvation in our lives. Receive our worship today, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
my sins far away Rising he justified Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day Oh glorious day One day they led him Up Calvary's mountain One day they nailed him To die on a tree Suffering anguish, despised and rejected Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He The hands that healed nations stretched out on the tree and Took the nails for me, living He loved me Dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away Rising He justified Freely forever One day He's coming Oh glorious day Oh glorious day One day the grave could Conceal Him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door Then he arose over death he had conquered Now is ascended, my Lord evermore Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him From rising again, living he loved me Dying He saved me Buried He carried My sins far away Rising He justified Freely forever One day He's coming Oh glorious day Oh glorious day Skies with His glories will shine Wonderful day my beloved one bringing My Savior Jesus is mine Living He loved me Dying He saved me Buried He carried My sins far away Rising He justified Freely forever One day He's coming Oh glorious day Oh glorious day
Because he lives, you and I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, because he overcame the grave, because he overcame death, and he lives again in heaven, he gives us the hope of eternal life. We thank God that, he, that the Lord, uh, our Savior Jesus Christ, gathered his disciples together that uh, day, that night before, he was, went through the trial and was crucified and shared with them the Passover meal and what we call the Last Supper. He broke the bread and told them that it represents his, his flesh, his body that's given for them, for us. He shared the cup, the wine, the fruit of the vine, and told them that represents his blood that he shed, that we might have salvation, that our sins might be washed away and we are white as snow in the eyes of God. We thank the Lord that we have this communion service, this Lord's Supper, to participate in each time that we gather to worship. We partake of the bread, we partake of the, cu the cup, and we remember the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But we also look forward to our future, our eternity in heaven, because Jesus lives. Our song of communion, our, our communion hymn today is, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let's sing that and meditate upon such wonderful words to remind us what these emblems this bread, this cup represent. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this communion time, for this Lord's Supper, the last supper that Jesus participated in with his disciples before he went to the trial, to the cross, to the tomb, to the resurrection to give us the hope of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. Help us today, Father, as we, as we survey, as we look at that cross and the empty tomb, that we remember your promise that Jesus will come again to receive us to you. 
Thank you, Father, for these emblems, for this remembrance. Bless us as we partake in Jesus' name. Amen. How Easter changes everything for us, for everyone, for the whole world. Today we begin a brand new sermon series called Made New. And it might go without saying, but the effects of Easter, the resurrection, have reverberated throughout history. Jesus' defeat of sin and death has changed everything. 
The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us as well. It changes us. It renews us. It breathes fresh life into us. And the key to this transformative power is our faith, our faith in God, our faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. New life is unlocked as we place our faith, hope, and trust in this saving work of Christ. But in order for there to be new life available for, all of, for, for humankind, there had to be a death. Last week we celebrated Easter. And that very first Easter morning began with sadness. The Messiah was dead. Jesus had been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he had been betrayed by one of his inner circle of disciples. He was beaten. And to add to that, that unfair trial where he was sentenced to death by crucifixion, and he was hung between two thieves on crosses. And then within, within hours, Jesus breathed his last breath, and he died. And with him died the hopes and dreams of those who had followed him. They believed that he was the one who would usher in the, the long-awaited kingdom of God and make all things right. But now they mourned the loss of their friend, their leader, their teacher. And Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and laid inside of a cold, dark tomb. And it seemed like the end. It felt so final. But what no one could see coming was that it was really just the beginning. Three days went by as Jesus' lifeless body lay in that tomb. And some of the disciples returned to their old ways of life. Any hope that they had was buried behind that massive stone that was rolled to cover the entrance to the tomb where Jesus lay. But then Sunday morning came, Easter morning, Resurrection Sunday, and, we, and uh, that we celebrated last Sunday. Easter arrived. Read with me from Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 1. As we read Matthew's gospel account of the resurrection, Matthew 28, beginning with verse 1. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. Now I'm sure you're wondering, well, Ron, what in the world? Last week was Easter. Why are we having an Easter, Easter sermon today, the week after? It's because of our focus over these next few weeks on what Easter has changed for us. How Easter has changed everything for us and made everything, including us, new. In this account in Matthew 28, the Bible tells us that at dawn, two women both named Mary went to Jesus' grave. Other places in the scriptures tell us that these women had come to anoint his body for burial. And suddenly this violent earthquake shook the ground as an angel of the Lord appeared and the angel rolled that stone away from the, tomb, from the tomb's entrance. This appearance of these angels in their clothing was shocking to these ladies, like lightning and bright white. The guards who were watching over the grave were so afraid that they ran away. 
the women were afraid too. But we thank the Lord, we thank God that they stayed and listened to the angels. The angel spoke tenderly to the, to the women. He spoke a word of comfort that's pronounced over people nearly 365 times throughout the scripture. He said, do not be afraid. The resurrection is not a time for fear or sadness. The resurrection is a time for joy. And though these women had come to care for Jesus' lifeless body, he wasn't there. The tomb was empty. He had risen. The women ran off to find the other disciples, no longer f filled with fear, but filled with joy. This account tells us several points of lesson for us today. The first is that Easter confronts our fears and offers us joy. We live in a world where it's easy to find ourselves in very similar places as these women in this story in Matthew 28. Any given Sunday, there are people all over the world who come to church expecting to find a lifeless Jesus. Many people are filled with anxiety and fear fearful that their lives will never change, fearful that their circumstances and situations just can't change, that their marriage can't be rescued, that their diagnosis is a foregone conclusion. For too many people, many of us, our lives are just dominated by anxiety and fear. Maybe this morning the first thing you need to hear is this message of the angel at the empty tomb. Do not be afraid. Easter, resurrection, confronts our fears. That empty tomb reveals the mighty power of God that was not just a reality for Jesus then, but it's a reality for us today. You know, author and speaker Beth Moore says it so well, when she says the power of the resurrection means that nothing but the tomb is meant to be empty. Nothing but the tomb is meant to be empty. Friends, Easter is a source of great joy for Christians. We're filled with joy because the resurrection power is able to make everything new. The empty tomb means your past can be made new. The empty tomb means your hope for the future can be made new. The empty tomb means your life can be made new. Joy is a byproduct of hope. Hope that if Jesus indeed has risen from the grave, then through our belief in him, there's absolutely nothing that is impossible for us either. Dwight L. Moody told the story of a bright young girl of 15 years of age who was suddenly taken ill, completely paralyzed on one side and nearly blinded by her disease. She heard the family doctor say to her parents as they stood by her bedside, she's seen her best days, poor child. No, doctor, she exclaimed, my de best days are yet to come when I shall see the king in his beauty. Think about it. This is our hope. Christ rose from the dead to give us a pledge of our own resurrection, our own rising. The resurrection is the great uh, antidote for fear of death. Nothing else can take its place. Riches, genius, worldly pleasures or pursuits. None of that can take the place of the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, no matter where you find yourself today, that empty tomb pushes back against your fear and reminds you and me that the best is yet to come because Jesus Christ is alive. We sang the song that says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Amen. A second lesson that we get from this is that a pro we, we ought to have a proper 
response to Easter, and that proper response is faith. Now, faith is a word that's used a lot in the church. We have faith in all kinds of things, but the kind of faith that the Bible speaks to is a deep trust in something or someone that cannot be explicitly proven. Once the tomb was found empty, it was unexplainable. But those women had a choice to make, just like the disciples did. Would they have faith in Jesus? Would they have the faith that Jesus was indeed alive? This has been the defining question for over 2,000 years now. Do we trust the resurrection? Do we believe that the power of God raised Jesus then and that that same power of God can make us new now? Paul addresses this question as he wrote to the early church in, the, in Rome. And he wants to make clear our proper response to that empty tomb. In Romans 10 and verse 9, Paul says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now friends, the way to experience the power of God that can make us new is a two-step process. Paul says, first, you have to declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. This means that we demonstrate that Jesus is our authority by the things that we say and the things that we do. It's the outward evidence of an inward conviction. Secondly, Paul says we have to believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead. Our hearts have to be convinced. They must be convinced that the power of God is real. The first step is an intellectual exercise. We think and we say, Jesus is Lord. The second step is an exercise in trust. Trusting that God raised his only begotten son from the dead and then took him back into heaven with the promise to return for us. You know, this can be illustrated using a chair. Here in the church, you're sitting in the pew. Maybe if you're joining with us online, maybe you're sitting in a chair or uh, on a sofa. But here we are. I have the stool that I keep right back here behind the pulpit. Sometimes I use it because of these old bones and these joints just don't work so well. But you know what? You and I, we sit, we sit in a chair of some sort every day. Do you realize that that is an act of faith? you first must intellectually decide, conclude that that chair, that stool, that sofa that you're sitting in is meant to be sat in and it's able to hold you up. And then you must trust that it can hold you by putting all of your weight on it and resting in its strength. Well, friends, the same is true for our faith in Christ because we have to trust that he will do what he said he will do. And we trust in his strength and the power of God. To celebrate the resurrection without making that fundamental decision to trust in Jesus' resurrection power is to really miss the whole point. You can be made new, and it's made possible through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God our Savior. Our faith ensures that we are found in Him. Our faith draws us to Him, and we accept Him as Lord, as Savior. The third lesson that this resurrection in this passage teaches us is that we need to allow Jesus to take the old and make it new. The Apostle Paul in another place speaks about the implications of placing our faith in Jesus. What it really means. What it, what it involves when we 
place our trust, our faith in him. You know, after Jesus' resurrection, there's an amazing transformation in the lives of the disciples. They encounter Jesus in, in so many different ways. They, they encounter him in his resurrected form. And it causes them to go from being afraid, be, fearing that their lives were, were going to be taken away. They hid. They ran away. But they went from being afraid to being bold witnesses of what they've seen and learned from Jesus. Paul expects this transformation to happen in the lives of every believer. Every believer even today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the apostle says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Paul says that when people put their faith and their trust in Jesus, they become new creations. You know, that first creation takes place in a garden in the book of Genesis. God created humankind without sin, and they existed in a perfect relation with him, relationship with him. And then the book of Genesis tells us that, that after sin entered the world, everything was broken and in disrepair. Man could no longer walk in the garden with God. And, you know, this is why Jesus did what he did. It was his broken body and his shed blood on the cross at Calvary that paid the price for our forgiveness of sin, that restored us to God, our Creator. Isn't it interesting that Jesus' body was laid in a tomb in a garden? It's in this second garden that a new creation takes place. All of our old ways of living are replaced with new ones. Jesus takes our selfishness and replaces it with generosity. He takes our anger and replaces it with love. He takes our addiction and replaces it with freedom. He takes our sin and replaces it with salvation. Friends, Jesus, our Savior, the Christ, the Messiah, he heals our brokenness, he binds our wounds, and he loves us unconditionally. He is worthy of our faith, hope, love, and devotion. Resurrection is the proof of the power of God. Today, even today, you can confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is alive and he wants to live and work in you. I beg you, invite him into your heart. Let him do the remodeling work that only he can do. Our song of decision and dedication today is one that says, In Christ alone I place my trust. In him alone I place my faith, my life. Will you do that today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your power. Not only your creative power, but your resurrection power, which you brought your son, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, to be alive from the dead, from the grave. Thank you for the power that through him you've given to us and placed in us. Through his blood, you have pay paid the price to redeem us from our sins. Through your spirit, through the power of your son and that resurrection power, you give us hope, faith, trust, and joy for our lives even today. In Christ alone, Father, we place our hearts, our souls, our minds, our lives in your hands. Thank you for loving us. 
Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for giving us hope. In Jesus' name, amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I Bye.